Apologies for that technical hitch. Of course, we're going to speak about what's happening as far as Qatar World Cup is concerned. And joining us this particular afternoon is one man who enjoyed the better part of proceedings as far as the group stage of the tournament is concerned. And, uh, you know, my name is Maxwell Wasike. Touchline is the show. And continue talking to us. Hashtag touchline Y254 at Wasike. Maxwell at Y254 channel. Of course, Ken Andrew is still with us on this particular platform. And let the conversation continues. And uh, Ali Amur, good to see you. How are you doing, man? Very well, Master. Thanks, sir. The Thanks, last sir. time you were here, it was one month down the line. I've been <laughs> seeing you enjoying, you know, while in Qatar and feeling a little bit of envious. But I, hopefully, <laughs> in 2026, I will be preparing to make it to a joint World Cup of Mexico, Canada, United States of America, and, and Canada. And Canada yeah. How was it like? How is it like? Uh, you know, actually, Maxwell, as I've been telling you before, football is about passion. So, planned for this long time back. You see, with networking of friends and uh, quite an adventure and uh, something memorable in a lifetime, yeah. You got an opportunity to watch uh, which matches live? One, three, four How many matches. of them? Four, four matches, yeah. Four matches? Yeah. Uh, probably, was there anyone involving an African team and how was Senegal, the experience Ghana, like? yes. Yeah. Senegal and Ghana, those are the African teams I've watched. Ken, I'm sure you yearn for such opportunities, right? Yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, when you grow up watching football and seeing the stars on TV, you dream of one day going to a stadium and watching them play live. So it must have been great to be him in Qatar at that time. It's, <laughs> it's a dream for, me, for very many young men growing up, yeah. And considering Qatar was manageable, probably going in terms of expenses associated, and some of us didn't manage to go, do you think... Uh, it will be possible for 2026 one or a more tall order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously it's a it's a bit of a tall order because of the distance and maybe the you know the visa and everything. But you know it's never impossible. You know, Alia said it's it's about passion. So if you really want to do it, you'll give everything for, so that you do it. Talk to us about you know the lessons we can borrow from Qatar organizing such a big sporting extravaganza in the world. And you know their facilities are wow. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, having, I mean, if you look at the Middle East, uh, the weather and everything, every, and people think that it's not possible for Qatar to have such a... Yes, uh, a people are a little bit here. skeptical. So, but I'll tell you one thing. It's a benchmark they have set, and I'm sure any other person who is trying to get World Cup into their country has to ask, there's a serious benchmark to meet. You see, that, that is extraordinary. That's what the Qataris have done. And uh, even when you look at the kilometers, I mean, from the distance from one stadium to another, it's amazing. You just get into a train underground and you get to the next stadium. You can watch two matches, or even three, depending on uh, the speed of your walking into the, the metro. You see. And uh, one lovely thing is they have built stadiums eh, which you can dismantle. For the first time, I think, a stadium built out of uh, uh, containers. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. They're improvised. Yes, improvised. And you can dismantle it and everything. And it's so cool. It's so cool. And well controlled temperatures uh, from this fan uh, base uh, up to the field. And uh, one remarkable thing and something that also good land, the way the field is being maintained is something else. With technology involved, with the body technology, as you've seen on TV, that is only when you see the field level, the kind of grass they've used, the way it's being maintained. The hygiene in the stadium, it's something you just can't imagine. And the controlling of the crowd, even when the crowds are coming in and they're going out. One amazing thing people didn't know about it is the metro is free, the buses are free. As long as you have your higher card, see, and the visa, you get through your higher card. You don't need to go through the embassy. It's online. You download your visa as long as you have your match ticket and hotel bookings. And you're in Qatar. So the process getting into Doha is not complicated. They are well organized, well organized. If you ask me, I'll give it. I'll give them ten out of ten. What is the distance like in terms of moving from one stadium to another? Is it like from Nairobi to Mombasa? No, 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 no. no. The Everything is within Nairobi. Ah. It's like you are moving from Nyayo Stadium to Kasarani, maybe to Kasarani, even nearer. What? Yes. You just go under the metro, and you are from Lucerne. You go to Tamam Stadium. Binali, I mean, uh, Education City, it's just within all those stadiums. So it is Doha based? It's Doha based. Everything? Everything. It's Doha based. 
in terms of you know infrastructure of course Kenya has been lagging behind you so yesterday CS Sports Ababu Namamba complaining about the uh, substandard uh, status of Kinoru Stadium which was supposed to host Kenya Premier League matches in Meru County and despite the reports that the facility was complete he was really lamenting that you know it doesn't match the standards that you know CAF and FIFA require of us to host international matches do you think we can borrow something from them Benchmarking, I say it's very good. I mean, for us to build stadiums, you need to go to countries where stadiums have, to, have been built to a certain standard and they'll not get depleted. See? Like Qatar, you have each seat. Just like what we see in Kasarani, the seats are just for individual. We don't have concrete seats. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason is that because you can, we want to know who is seat on that seat. The ticket owner. If there's anything, a crime, we know exactly seat number 56. Yeah, the ticket was bought by so-and-so and is the one who's sitting there. There's a reason why the seats are numbered. There's a reason why the seats are put in a way that when the scooter come in, there is no, like, a rush. There was no rush in Qatar. And one day we'll have a stadium, I mean, spectators up to 40,000. Yeah, and people just move out. No rush, no nothing. Yeah. And to build such structures, they'll help you professionally to grow. Because you don't have structures, it means you don't have facilities for your youth to come in and enjoy those facilities. And it's not very expensive, it's just about doing the right things. That's what I think the Qataris did. They did the right thing. Ken, I'm sure you've got so many questions for Ali, considering you're a footballer and it's a footballing tournament happening in Qatar. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I'd ask, uh, before, you know, like before the tournament, there was a lot of talk about uh, the, how Qatar, you know, is perceived as a country, you know, it's an Islam country and they are not willing to bend their rules for anyone. So I'd ask from your experience, maybe with the fans, with the stakeholders there, um, was all that talk before the, the, the tournament really there? You know, uh, it's always good to express yourself. I mean, uh, it's, we are living in a democratic world, so expression is, everybody is expressing themselves about Qatar and all these other things. But once they went into the country, and want, we went to the country and saw the experience, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Qatar unveiled, uh, you know, the, the, the council uh, the put yeah. on. Uh, it has flags for different countries. Mm -hmm. the, the traditional. Mm -hmm. People are amazed with that. Mm -hmm. You see, the reception. Yeah. yeah, and everybody will meet in one place. I think it's called Sukwakif, where all the fans are meeting there. You see, so the hype starts from there, and now they move out to the stadium, and they come back again. No issues of security, no issues of uh, fights and everything, no. I mean, they did a good job. Almost, I'm telling you that it's an amazing job. It's an amazing. And another thing is, Wi-Fi was free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, internet free. And once you get in, you can get your Oredo card and everything. For three days, uh, you have free WhatsApp. I mean, you can chat with your friends and free of charge. Uh. That's, that's something that is very attractive. It tells you how receptive uh, they were. And a, a lot of learnings for us here. I mean, to take, bring it back home and see how what we've learned from them. Mm. Yeah. Besides that noise of, uh, you know, Qatar being an Islamic country and the yeah. lifestyle associated with the nation that is hosting the tournament, there was also noise of a ban of sale of alcohol around the stadium and how Gianni Infantino was being condemned and he received a huge criticism from some quarters over that particular development. Was that, you know, uh, in some way affect the uh, I've magnitude always, of the I always believe, I say, each house has its own rule. <laughs> if you, you come to if my I house, come to your house, respect. I have respect to your, your rules. I think that's what they're trying to say. This is our house, these are our rules, you see. And uh, we, people have to accept and, uh, and respect their rules. You know, that, I mean, that's what happens. If we were South Africa, the South Africans say we vuvuzela. Uh, yes. People made, made noise, but that's what they wanted. That was the rule. Vuvuzela is something that it's there inactive. So, yeah, yeah it's that's how it is. If there are house rules, then house rules are being affected. But the most important thing, the core is the tournament. How is it? Yeah. Yeah. Now everybody has is now excited. They are forgotten about their house rules. Everybody is focused on uh, the knockouts and how amazing this World Cup has come in terms of uh, tension and not sure. Like yesterday, we were not sure if uh, Uruguay is going to go out. Uh, I mean, mm. uh, we thought maybe they're going to be saved by the, by the Portuguese uh, mm. side by, by defeating Korea. But now, now that, that tension, uh, that, that passion, that's what has created this uh, Qatar to be more one of the most successful uh, uh, World Cup tournaments.
And Ken, you know, football yeah. is supposed to bring all of us together, regardless of, you know, religion, regardless of race, regardless of, you know, tribe like in Kenya, regardless of gender. And yeah. uh, we've witnessed what happens in Africa, especially, and uh, more so in Kenya, you know, when teams get to lock horns against each other, FC Leopards and Goroma, when they are playing in Mashemeji Derby, there is not that aspect of sportsmanship and, mm. you know, some outcome result into chaos. I'm sure that is something contrary to whatever that you witnessed in Qatar when teams yeah. are playing against each other, yeah. even fans get to hug each other. You know, the, the beautiful about it, it's after the match, you have to go into the metro with the same fans, the same opponents. <laughs> so that's a beautiful part. And everybody works together. You know, the way they've controlled the crowd on exiting, it's unique. And as you're working out, there's some activities, different kind of uh, country uh, dances, traditional dances, you know, some, something to uh, entice, something to make you happy. You know, so you, even if you are defeated, then you go, you see there's a stop, and you see, you know, even Kenyans, mm. yeah, Kenyan dancers were there, mm. you know. Then you go, you find uh, some Turkish dancers from, from different countries. And all of you go into one metro, and everybody's putting a different jersey of their, of their beloved uh, country that they're, they're supporting. And uh, people congratulate each other and have fun, and that's it. This is, this is unique. Yeah, it was unique, actually. Mm. I think uh, if I'm to ask something, it's about the stadium, because the one that was built with Container uh, Stadium 974, 974 I, and yeah. it's going to be taken apart. I think uh, that is something that can be done here in Kenya, because it has happened. It's a great archi architectural thing, and Kenya can try to implement it. But do you think uh, currently with uh, the people involved in especially football, do you think that they are far off that, or... Is it something that we can expect it happening soon? You know, football is visionary. Mm. It's about putting structures mm. and having professional people to take it to a different level. Mm. And not Kenya necessarily, most of the countries in Africa, once you don't have structures, then development of football becomes an uphill task. Yeah. It's a challenge. Mm. Yeah. And the structures should combine with the law, yeah. you see, the law of the country. Because today, I mean, we have a lot of youth maybe over 50 or 60% of our population is youth based. If we don't have structures for this youth, what are we giving birth tomorrow? Mm. I usually tell people is structures are the key, is a key, is a key pillar to success. I also heard Waziri saying the same thing. He keep on echoing, machinani, machinani, machinani. What does machinani mean? Machinani means if that young talent should have a facility okay, so that the talent can be seen. World Cup made all scouts globally yeah. fly into Qatar to see what? Talent. But that is only matured talent. Yeah. That's a mature market. The World Cup is a mature market. It's, a, it's an epic of footballers. Well, you see, I know this guy plays for Liverpool or for Man City or from uh, uh, Paris Saint Germain, but I think we need to negotiate. I want him to transfer from this team to this. But that is already a mature. Uh, in marketing, you say that's a key account market. That's a, a Carrefour or something. When you go, you have everything already cooked. What about this other market? And that's what Qatar did. They have an academy. Yeah. That team you see is from a, an academy. They played together for four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe luck didn't fall by, it's by their side, but it's a team that the coach has built. Now, you, for us to be successful, we have to go to the grassroots. We have to put those structures. We have. Because if a scout is coming to this country and they want to witness, an, uh, I mean, to scout on under 17, where will you go today? Or under, under 15, where will you go? Or under 23? So if there's a structure, I know exactly, if I want an under 15, players who are under 15, there's a league already going on, I will go to that league. Mm -hmm. We have academies we have there which have very good intention in this country. But these academies, they can go as that far see, and actually uh, market themselves. But if there's a pipeline from those academies into those structures, yeah. then we can actually move as a country, as footballers. We have a lot of talent in this country. Yes. More talent than what you can imagine. But our talent, there's no light beaming our talent. Yeah. Our talent is in darkness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Kenyans have always been optimistic that with the increment of you know, teams taking part in World Cup, 
our country can possibly make it and qualify but now that you know the tournament is happening of course getting represented by five african countries kenya excluded and most kenyans are there just like you indicated earlier they are watching uh, the games how is the experience from kenyans watching like our compatriots from africa in ghana in senegal cameroon morocco tunisia taking on the rest of the world in our absence you know, Max, uh, we Kenyans, we, we are known not to be a spectator nation. Mm -hmm. We are a performing nation, especially when it comes to sports. We are but a performing what's nation. Us? Yeah, we are a performing nation. All those teams that are played there, we've played against them. And we've had some very good results, historically. Yes, true, true. We've played against them, we have some very good results. We played against Ghana, we played against Cameroon, uh, we played against Morocco. I mean, we've been having very good results. And they know Kenya is a tough place, you just can't come and pick points. You know, but now, being a performing nation, how do we go back to a performing I said, again, I'll go back to a Structures have to be placed. The structures, transparency, so those are the key things. Uh, once you put those kind of structures in place, they will actually grow. Then put professional to run those structures. People who understand. Uh, football is a huge employment. You yes. You've seen in Qatar, how many people are employed because of football? Yeah. Yeah, a tournament of a month, yeah. you can imagine. So that tournament, is for a year, for us here. So the same kind of employment, we can actually get it back here at home. We can employ the same people. And if you look at the numbers, if you actually put numbers in place, you see the kind of employment you can get. Out of football only, not even other sports. Yeah. Yeah. So for us to go back into performing lessons, we have to put structures in place. Proper structures and facilities. Ken, I'm sure at your age you haven't watched most World Cup tournaments besides this one of Qatar yes. and the 2018 in Russia yeah. and probably 2014 and like Aliu has watched many of them followed by myself. <laughs> What's your comparison? Compare and contrast the ongoing tournament and the previous ones that you've managed to catch a glimpse. I think uh, this group stage phase number one has, is better than Russia and uh, and Brazil 2014 because of all the drama that we've witnessed especially in the final games of the of the of the group stages you know things were changing in a trice you you are leaving you're not leaving so I think it's it's better than that and also I think uh, the quality of football for the African teams and also the uh, team like Saudi Arabia Korea Japan has really really improved you know for them to get wins for example Japan to beat Spain and Germany you know, that's really great, you know. Maybe they wouldn't have done it in 2014, 2018, but you see, this time they, they play with a certain desire that their other teams didn't have. And for the African teams, you know, you know, uh, Cameroon beating Brazil, that, that's, uh, even though they went out, that's a really, really uh, immense result. Ghana, 3-2 versus Portugal, really, really big results for African nations. Belgium getting hammered by Morocco. No one saw that happening. So, in terms of quality, all around the African teams and even the Asian teams, you know, there's been a big, big improvement. Critical points to have mentioned because I remember I was catching uh, an action between, you know, like yesterday, Uruguay and mm. Ghana. Despite the result, Uruguay having beaten Black Stars of Ghana, they thought probably they would qualify. But there was a game that was concurrently happening and mm. <laughs> it was supposed to determine the fate of the qualification to the last 16. Of course, that game beating. It was Portugal and South Korea. Portugal and South Korea, and yeah. quite an upset. South Korea beating yeah. Portugal and now thwarting the efforts of Uruguay yeah. qualifying. And the same thing happened. Uh, drama, of course. Mm -hmm. You remember it was France against Tunisia. Yeah. And yeah. Tunisia beating the holders. Yeah. And uh, I think that makes the beauty of our game, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, as I said, when uh, the. the, the, the uh, the whistle is blown to start the match. People have predictions. <laughs> Even before that, I said, this team is going to win because they base their uh, prediction on historical uh, successes of the particular team. Yeah. And also, they base on their prediction on the, uh, the leagues that these teams are playing, very competitive leagues. Yes. Uh, yeah, EAPL, uh, uh, Serie A, La Liga. You see, they're playing very competitively. But what, what they're forgetting is these other teams the Moroccans, the Tunisians, the Senegalese, the Ghana, the Cameroonians, go back and see what they have done into their countries. There are some structures. Mm. The Asian football has changed. You remember 
There were days that you're saying, ah, there'll be Asian football used to be beaten seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm -hmm. It has changed. Because Putta realized for us to have a proper team, let's start from the basics. So they're building the basics. Today, if you go to Saudi Arabia, they have very good youth structures. Yeah. yeah. 30 years, 20 years, you won't see that. But today, youth structures are there. Uh, you go to Japan, the same thing. Yeah. That's why you think Japanese players now going to play professional football. Yeah. You never used to see that. Senegal, look at Senegal. I mean, they have very good uh, youth structures. Yeah. And Asian football, I can actually recommend them. They have, I can commend them. They have grown to a certain level that they've showed how professional, how good they are in the field. The Japanese, they play with passion, discipline, consistency and focus. Mm. They never got tired. They never gave up. The Koreans did the same thing. The Moroccans did the same thing. The Tunisians did the same thing. Because they you know if you guys are playing 4 4 2, we'll go to a 5 4 2 system or 5 4 1 system. Mm. And this is how we're going to beat you. They started the game. And all this is managed by one thing technology. Mm. Technology. To, in today's football, if you don't embark on technology, you are still on manual and guessing power, then it all happened. You've seen, I mean, uh, the last goal that was scored by was it Japan on the other day, that went against Spain. Against line. Spain, yeah. See, it was counted in. Technology now plays a vital role. The new offside uh, 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 rule. Yeah. Uh, that is technology. So uh, we should ask ourselves, our Kenyans, if that is a level of technology, we locally, where are we right now? Are we doing the right things? You see, are we doing the wrong things? Where do we need to fix locally now? Because uh, uh, Kenya is a big economy. Kenya is quite a big economy if you compare to some a few West African countries. And technology are very advanced. If you go to the fintech world, we are very much advanced. You see, but now technology in sports. You see, that is a key factor that is ailing our soccer in this country. We don't have technologies. Yes. I mean, we don't have. I mean, uh, today. Uh, I've seen, well, you've seen people remove when they remove the jazz, there's this black thing like a bra they're putting yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You know what's that? You see, that thing is a gadget that tells you, tracks the, the player, yeah. endurance, kilometers covered, and everything, position, and all that. So that data is being filled back to the analysis. So the Nicole team sits down and tells the coach, we agreed on this system, but this player was actually getting out of the system all the time. Or they give them instant information. So unlike before, you have to wait and go back and sit down, which that is the stage we are. Things have changed. Things have changed. And we are still dormant. We don't want to, you know, we need to make what we call a, a frog leap into technology and how to manage our teams. And we, we will only be successful if now starting to have local coaches sending them outside, you see, and young millennials to go and learn about football analytics. Mm. It will help us grow very fast. So that you don't make a substitute by guessing on the technical, say that guy is tired, no. Yeah. He's, there's a target, he's supposed to cover seven kilometers, he's only serving three kilometers. There's a problem here, what do we do? So all those substitutions that are being made, eh, they're being made out of affirmed decisions. And you've mentioned about a very critical point uh, of substitutions, and I think that to some extent has costed African teams playing at the World Cup. You remember when Ghana was taking on yeah. Portugal and the subs he yeah. was making? Them, I yeah. think the team was doing very well and on the verge of winning that match, but the moment some player was removed, I don't know whether it's Kudus, Kudus. then yeah. things changed. You know, uh, sometimes the coach have seen that, yes, I need to substitute, but when you do it eh, in between a goal mm. and you're bringing a new team, you know, by the time they form back their formation and they're in, I mean, they've played again, it takes quite a bit, five, three, up to seven minutes for someone to settle as a substitute. So, so those are what you call technical errors that coaches made, but I think the coach knew exactly what he was doing. Mm. Maybe unfortunately it, the system could not, did not work. Yeah. You know. So coaches do make substitution because they know that this substitution is going to bring... You, we've seen other subs coming in and their fruits being made out of the subs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ken? I think I totally agree with Ali on, this, on the technology and science in sports because, for example, if you look at the bench of 
advanced countries, you know, everyone, even the doctors are on comms, you know, stand by this, no shouting, there's no calling using, they just speak into it and that's it, you know. And also from the data, you know, th that's collected on the, the, the tracker itself, it, it could have helped some countries, you know, make better decisions because, you know, you can't just judge a player I'm a choker because he's he's not running fast enough or something. So you have Maybe, to yeah. use the data. Yeah, it, you have to use the analytical data. And, you know, if we look at where we are right now and where they are, you know, they can have data in by halftime on how 45 minutes has gone. It's processed in two, three minutes and the coach knows you, why is your, why, even why is your heart beating faster today? You know, they have all that. So for us, you know, it's to try and incorporate that, you know. We don't have to really go all out, but we have to start slow a little bit of it. Gradual. Gradual, you know, because we know our football is coming off a ban and everything. But these are the sort of ideas we should really try to implement from just this this World Cup, yeah. And talking about our football coming off a ban, Ali, what do you make of, you know, the lifting of the suspension by FIFA, you know, the communication that came from Zurich? Yeah, very good Gianni news. Continue. I mean, to me, it was very good news. It was well, well, uh, well everybody wanted that. And uh, I think everybody, each Kenyan wanted to see the FIFA ban being lifted, you see. And the, the lift of FIFA ban, now we go back to our drawing books, is what lessons are we learning? Because this is not the first FIFA ban which is being lifted. Yeah. What are the lessons are we learning? Why should we go all the time into that direction? Unless we know the why. Yeah? And now we come to the how they will not go back to the same direction, you see. Uh, one thing I will say, when there's a FIFA ban, usually people sit. People bring people together and say, we've been banned, what are the reasons? And unfortunately to say is, once you hide, once you say, you, you go blindly and say, no, because so-and-so is there, so-and-so is here, so it's okay for us to be banned. That's what killing football in this country transparency. I should have the guts to tell you, Maxwell, you are wrong. We should do this thing the right way. You see, once, you have, once we have that kind of approach to our football, then we will grow. But as long as we are partisanism, if there is something wrong, we don't want to talk about it, that kills football. That kills football in this country. And that's what has been killing football in this country. Yeah. But we put structures, and those structures are transparent, and everybody is accountable, like what the CS was saying the other day. You have to be transparent. You have to be accountable of what you are doing. And they should professionalism all the way. And I'm t t once we put those as seeds, we will grow. I was telling Ken, mm -hmm. I think that interim suspension, to some extent, probably, it ought to have been positive in these guys yes. for Kenyan football, so that we use that yeah. window to put a house in order and to rectify things because yes we are very grateful to Gian Infantino FIFA lifting the suspension but what next because I understand is there any active football qualification that Kenya is supposed to go through maybe for Kenyan clubs to play in CAF Champions League and CAF Confederation so we ought also to have used that opportunity of one year outside world footballing activities to, there's, you know. There's something actually I learned in Qatar, and I said in Qatar. Yes. All those teams that went there, they went with their legions. Yeah. All the teams that are particip participated in Qatar, and even those, you know, they went with their legions. And the legions eh, are more also involved with the teams. They are mentors, Cameroon, they are brand Samuel ambassadors, Leto, yes. of ambassadors, they are brand ambassadors. Once you respect your legions, because they have been in the field, I saw you they took have a delivered. lot of photos with the likes of Roberto Carlos Cafu. Yeah, many what are of they them, doing? I mean, it's the legionary part of it. They come and talk to the teams. They are given Giving opportunity, yes. And they have outside activities. You see, clinics. There are a lot of football clinics in Qatar. You see, some of the players who are active are also going into adverts. You see, like for example, uh, Neymar. Neymar has, is advertising a local telco, Oredo. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And most of those legions are brand ambassadors for FIFA itself. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're brand ambassadors for itself. And that is what, what we say, cream de la cream in a tournament. When you see somebody has won five or four World Cups appearing there, it's an attraction. It's marketing of FIFA in itself. So here, we need to have a structure whereby our legions 
are involved in terms of putting this kind of structure. And I'll give you an example. Somebody is playing for a national team. I'll give you a name, say like Morilla. He's won enough cups, there's discipline in him, you can see it. Bobby, the same thing. Uh, JJ, same thing, and many more. Even the uh, young generation, the uh, Kinauliech and uh, uh, Mariga, who've come in, these guys can bring in a lot in terms of, this is sports uh, structures, the youth academy. You know, if you have a brand ambassador who is at upcountry, so like, for example, like George Fundy, upcountry, yeah? and this guy is used to talk about discipline in football, success in football. See? And when the, the millennials, the kids, look at him and say, who is this guy? This is what he's done. And I remember telling people, unless now we'll have what they call a football museum, it's very key to have a football museum so that even our kids, even our sp young sports people, footballers, can go into this museum and see the success of Kenyan football. Kenya has a lot of successes, but we're not talking about it. So having that connection, and, uh, and that there'll be a lot of wisdom exchanged. But we have to have to pro the proper, a proper institution to see into all that. When you go to Mashinani, Today, if you're at home, and like now December is coming, a lot of football tournaments coming in. Yes. We'd like to see a, only an under-15 tournament. Yeah. You see, you've gone there, you've seen, you take a picture or a video, you can send it back to a coach. I said, when I was at home, at country, I saw this boy, look at his video. Now it's very easy to, to capture talent. You have your phone, just capture it and send it back. Yeah. No. But success will not come until there are structures. And I'm telling you, we can see a million years. But if there's no structures and transparency and accountability, then these are shortcuts. Shortcuts are very expensive to success. I think Ken, what is also ailing us is governance aspect of the game because yes. our administrators and uh, managers have, you know, failed to address the, uh, you know, welfare of a key person in this game who is a player, and you know the bugs uh, stops with. You know, administrators failing to look at the grievances of an athlete. And that's what Ababu Namamba was saying while he was having a joint conference, a media presser with Kenya Rugby Union regarding unpaid dues and allowances of Shuja players who are supposed to travel to Dubai for all seven series. Yeah, I think the administration is really failing the players because if you look at where we are right now and where the more advanced countries are, you know, it's a, it's a really, it's a like, a lot of steps backwards, you know. Uh, number one, you know, the play is the most important thing. He's the one who's being seen on the TV. He's the one who's playing for the country. He's the one who's actually going to the representation. Sweating. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really fighting. And you are the, they're the ones you see in tears when things don't go well, you know. If we look at Kenya right now, when we go to tournaments, you know, sometimes the players don't even have the, the tickets. They, they sleep in hotels, you know, and you find that the leadership of a team is already there. <laughs> They're waiting for the players who are going to play, who are in, a air, in an airport somewhere. And even if you look at uh, the Europeans, the, their country, sometimes even the players are asked uh, to bring their significant others, not but themselves, but the FA can, for example, ask England players what they want, their significant others there. So we're really way, way behind. And I think some of the people in the administration, they lack, uh, they're selfish, you know. That's, that's the feeling I get. They're selfish, they want, they, they take too much care of themselves, you yes. know. They, they don't want to sacrifice sometimes in, to have this player, you know. Yes. Have everything and go give us your all, you know. Ali, as we wind up on that particular note, the call by CS Sports, Ababu Namamba saying that he will crack the whip on air and federations. Is it something you support? You know, uh, I have a saying, it said, burn the bush. When you burn the bush, eh, it's a snake. Uh, it's an everything elephant, everything. So what the CS is doing is the right thing. Burn the bush, clear it up completely. Then put your pillars, say this is governance. If you're not compliant, we are not talking. You see, Sports Act is key. We can't jump it. You can't ignore it. Because that Sports Act will come and protect the player you're talking about. It has audit inside, it has integrity, it has everything. You know, the other thing, the sad story is about players. Yeah? In all this noise eh, we had, have you had people going, apart from players themselves, say, this is our player. They cry that you hear yeah, that this is our player. He doesn't have a medical cover. Players themselves, 
No insurance. No insurance. But players collect money and actually say, let's help this. I'm in a Legion group here. Uh, it's on the most things are not echoed, but if they're to be echoed in that Legion group and see how many players that their own players, ex players, eh, have actually been collecting money to go and help their own. You see. And you don't see officials coming in. You don't see officials coming in. And as he said, when you look at the tears outside, did you see the officials crying, apart from the fans and the players? Mm -hmm. I only do it because the passion, players have passion to do. And your revenue streams is out of those players. If you don't have players, there's no football. You know? So I agree with Waziri, sports compliance, it's very, very key. You know, accountability is very key, transparency is very key. You know? And once he does that, once he burns the bush and put everything in order with transparency, things are going to work out very well. And players' contract is key. We will echo it. I'll personally, I personally always echo it. Your, the contract, the players should be inducted of how to read, write, sign a contract. You know, with our clubs. Then now to our clubs. It's time our clubs to put the arts together. We need youth in our clubs. We need women team in our clubs. That is very, very important. Because that's how you're going to channel the structure. The clubs are doing very well but they need to actually up, up, up their game a bit. So you have a team in KPL, they have a youth team, and they have a women team. Yeah. yeah. That's how, you know, I, I mean, we can, we're, going to, we're going to develop football. You saw uh, a women referee, World Cup. Yes. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a milestone? Yeah. Yeah? That's a big milestone, yeah, but you have women referees. Do you know they are being paid equally? Yeah? Mm. They're being paid equally. So give opportunity also to women in football. It will grow. We have very good talent, but they need to be given an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, gentlemen, it's been an honor having you on board and talking about World Cup experience with Ali Amur, who was uh, in Qatar for the better part of the tournament during the group stage, enjoying some few live matches, especially those involving African teams and uh, We've seen now the pairing for the last 16 and the games today, of course, beating Argentina against Australia, then United States of America, playing who? Netherlands. Netherlands. Yeah. And uh, we yeah. will be seeking to en continue enjoying the action. Ali Amur, you are parting short your final words. Are you going for the final? Yeah, uh, Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maxwell, yes. I mean, uh, the opportunity is almost coming through. And we'll be there, God willing, if everything goes on well we will be at the finals. You see, my, my parting shot, my parting shot is uh, we have now another opportunity. Our banner has been lifted. You see, unless we come all together and put those structures and give CS an opportunity because what he needs is an opportunity and support so that he can deliver what he really meant to deliver. Once we are given, is given that support, of which I'm sure he has it, and he will deliver. Let's respect governance. Let's be accountable. Let's forget our differences and put them aside and say, this is for but the benefit of Kenya. That flag, that national anthem, Maxwell, the national anthem. When you hear this national anthem and you look at a Senegalese or a Ghanaian or a Moroccan, sing that national anthem the passion in it, it's something else. And I remember uh, in an interview in Al Jazeera, one of the footballers, uh, a, a legend, uh, I think it was, it was a Spanish or something, I can't remember the country. He was saying, World Cup is when the national anthem is being sung. And you know, you are here chosen by your country to represent them in a world global Some tournament. monumental feeling. Yeah, I usually call World Cup a UN sports. You see the UN meet, eh? Yeah. Now sports, World Cup is part of it. It's how the people beat. So if we work hard together and if we start building a national team today, in four years, and as per the CS words, we're going to be in World Cup. But we need to start building it today. You see, and once we get into a coach, that coach should be permanently with that team, just like Ali Sisi. Yeah. Permanently. We give him chance. Even if he loses for the four years or three years, but let that coach have that one team and gear to it. You see, then channels of ensuring the scouts are coming in to pick a good talent and export them outside. We have the talent.
but our talent is in darkness because we don't have structures. Thank you. Thank you, Ali Amur, for coming through and sharing your insights with what you learned in Qatar during your few days stay in Doha for the FIFA World Cup and ongoing 22nd edition of the tournament currently and we're entering the last 16. Of course, don't go away, stay tuned. We're coming back with, you know, discussion regarding the last 16 pairing and how would that pan out. But before then, let's enjoy the interesting moments of the FIFA World Cup in Qatar.